Jessica has been doing this for a long time. I mean, she's only 24, but at 23, she's founded the Dress for Success, a global nonprofit that helps more than a million women in 30 countries achieve economic independence. And she served for many years as the CEO of Do Something God Work. She's the author of the bestseller Zilch. She's been on Oprah, on 60 Minutes, on CNN. But don't let the polished resume fool you. Nancy is tenacious and dynamic and extremely funny. Most importantly, to me, <laughs> she is one of the best listeners I know and really intuits the needs of people, I think sometimes even before they can articulate it for themselves. Uh, we hosted an event earlier this week with Dr. Kissinger and Marshall Scholar Bill Burns on the art of diplomacy, and I actually think Kissinger's comments about Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who, as you all know, is one of the key architects of the Marshall Plan, actually could have been words about Nancy. She has an uncanny and profound understanding of the intangibles of human motivation. And she uses that understanding to lower barriers and create opportunities for people. She meets them exactly where they are and gives them tools. And those tools are to better their lives at little cost in New York. It's also her birthday tomorrow. So I hope you would all wish her a happy birthday. And please welcome me and see you in the Thank you, Nell. That was a very nice introduction. And if you, or let's just say any member of your family ever needs a kidney or a lung, let me know. Five sentences for me or less. Five, five sentences or less, let's. On you? Yeah, okay, no, less. So, I know, this is going to be hard. You just set up so. We just like way more important, so I did single words for you. Okay, here's my introduction for me. Entrepreneur, VC, uh, author, podcaster, citizen activist, alum of Putney, Stanford, and Oxford, CBE, which I, I'm going to be honest, I kind of had to look it up today. It, it's amazing. It's commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Yes. Which sounds a little bit Bill and Ted to me. Most excellent. Um, Marshall Scholar, philanthropist, but the title that most of us out here know him as is nicest guy in Silicon Valley. Now, in fairness, it's sometimes a low bar. Um, um, but we, 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 oh, we can lose that card easily. Um, uh, so before we start, I just want to, um, who, is anyone here British? Do we have actual Brits here? I want to congratulate you on getting through something called Group G. And say, good luck on Tuesday. And to just let you know that there will be no other mention of sport for the next hour. <laughs> Oh, so that's what that is. That's what that is. Okay. okay. And are there any other Marshall Scholars here? Yay! And I don't care if there are any Rhodes Scholars here. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so, there's one? I'm sorry. Okay. So, I am funny. So, um, so you were a Marshall Scholar at Oxford, and you studied philosophy. And at the time when you went, you, you, um, you wanted to be a public intellectual. And uh, it was all about answering the question, well, two questions it seems like when you were at Oxford. One was, do I want to pursue this academic thing? And the other one was a little question, who are we? So it feels like you answered the first one, I don't want to be an academic. So I'm going to give you like 30 seconds to answer the second one. Who are we? <laughs> Where does this go from here? Um, well, uh, I would say that the uh, book that I most enjoyed a couple of years ago was Sapiens. Um, I think that the question about who we are and who we could be, because actually I think when you look back and you say we tend to be a bunch of quasi-sociopathic tribalists, um, is unfortunately a lot of human history, but the, we aspire to be the evolution of not just intelligence, but hopefully wisdom and compassion in the universe. And where does technology come in on that spectrum? Because uh, different instruments and tools have been part of those evolutionary um, roller coasters along the way. So, um, you know, te most technology can be 
used, obviously, for both uh, ill or good. Like a lightsaber. <laughs> like a lightsaber. Um, actually, one of the more entertaining things is when I was doing an event in Amman, Jordan, and I made a uh, joke that I, uh, when I became a VC that I had traded in my entrepreneur blue lightsaber for a VC red lightsaber. Everyone got it. Um, and it was like, wow, that's cultural around the world. <laughs> um, but the... Uh, uh, but I think that the question is, is through technology we can, uh, with in intent and culture and, and maturity, we can realize better societies, right? I mean, there's not only, obviously, and if you haven't tracked prices text line, you should. I'll say this first, Nancy, but the, you know, how do you provide kind of modern uh, support and help across a network for teens and other people who, who need it at the right time? It's something that's provisioned, that's made possible by technology. It takes human effort and work and a massive core of volunteers who are pouring out hours. Go on. Yes, <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, you know, I, so I think it's, it, it is an essential tool uh, to help us in our evolution, but it's not just because, because it's technological it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. It's how we use it, how we deploy it, what we do with it. Big part of your job or your life has been investing in those technologies that you see that can massively scale. And you've been incredibly successful on that. I mean, uh, I don't know if people know, uh, but you were really one of the first investors in Facebook. You didn't make the movie, but that's probably okay. You didn't want to be in the movie. Yeah, but um, it didn't work out so well for some of the people in the movie. But um, actually it did. But um, <laughs> they were fine. They did just fine. <laughs> Um, but uh, at one point in time, you were nicknamed the man with the golden touch. Um, uh, and, uh, and Goldie, Dave Goldberg, used to talk about how, um, and unfortunately he passed away, but he would talk about how you were one of the best investors um, in Silicon Valley. So companies, obviously LinkedIn is yours, but um, Facebook, Airbnb, I don't know if people know that uh, Reed was one of the earliest investors in so many companies. PayPal. PayPal, kind of a big one. Um, you didn't, I'm talking about investing in, not just working on it, no, shaping and no, creating. No, I did invest as well. You did invest, that was smart. And, uh, <laughs> and I, am, I am moved by how committed you are to the notion of citizenship and to social change. And so many of the companies that you've invested in are, are not that way. And so my question is, how do you decide what to invest in? How do you decide, is it just that, like this is gonna make a billion dollars and so I wanna back this? Or this is going to be an important thing, and so I went back inside to find that stuff. So uh, I won't invest in anything that I think is immoral or destructive. How do you define that? Well, so roughly speaking, I think that it, it uh, so for example, I've passed on investments that are essentially gambling related because it's basically trying to milk people who have addictive personalities or math disorders. Um, you know, so, you know, there's, um, you know, so there's things like that that are obvious, like negative. Um, I pass on investments because I thought, uh, I won't answer the follow-up question to this, but, you know, the, the CEOs were not very good human beings. Um, and so, yes, I, I know you would normally answer the follow-up question, so I was pre-advertising, I, I won't have to answer it. Um, but, uh, so... I would say that I kind of roughly go to two classes. There's one class, which is, by the way, you know, business is the thing that generates the economics for, med uh, you know, medical and education and everything else. So, the creation of good businesses, actually, I think, is is in, in basic. As long as it's delivering a, uh, a a positive good or service, is a is a is a good thing. And you know, you employ a bunch of people and those sorts of things. So, I will invest in those businesses if they if they will turn out to be great investments. Um, I prefer investments that have a mission to them where that mission is, uh, helps make the world the way it should be. Um, so like for example, take Airbnb. Uh, the, the question is, is to say, well, part of what you're doing is you're saying there's a, a bunch of people who are hosts who have this enormous illiquid asset that is their house or apartment or anything else that could afford mortgages, could afford other things by essentially becoming a, a little mini b and um, and so that's huge. But then also for the travelers, look, what kind of, 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 of cultural connectivity do you want? We want actually where you meet locals, where you talk to them, you understand kind of what the local culture is like uh, and, and kind of breed that level of human understanding and the, the, the human being in all of 
us. And so, uh, so that is the kind that I most often go to, or creates an interesting new sets of employment, or you know that kind of thing is is most often uh, what I do. And so, for example, um, you know LinkedIn obviously is try to help everyone be able to invest in their own economic career in a way that they can maximize their own economic destiny. Um, and so that that's actually the the real substance of the drive of investing. Now, I will say for entertainment, one of the things I, I, I when I talk about my investing in front of uh, MBA classes, yep. one of the things I will do to try to wake people up is I will actually say in the consumer internet, I invest in one or more of the seven deadly sins. Love this talk. Right? Yeah, go ahead. And, the, and you know, so then they say, well, what are LinkedIn? It's greed. You know, what about Facebook? It's vanity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason was is because in order to get to massive scale, you actually have to uh, appeal at some level to the appetite structure of human nature. Because actually, in fact, part of being a venture capitalist is you're somewhat of a predictive anthropologist. Is this is how the human ecosystem will play out with this dynamic of how this product works. Now, the ideal is you take these, these appetites and you transform them into something that helps people evolve, right? So yes, there are a number of people on um, LinkedIn because because what they most care about is the increase in salary, perfectly fine, just like business. But then there's also people like, okay, how do I have a more meaningful career? How do I have a more impactful career? How do I find my way to do things? Uh, how do I start a company? All those kinds of things, and you're enabling all of them. This is the thing that I think people don't understand that is a common thread, I think, in your career, which is um, uh, you haven't just shaped institutions, you've shaped markets. And the theme has actually been networks and connecting people. So even marketplaces like Airbnb, but also before Facebook and LinkedIn, you funded Six Apart, right? So you were very early in the networking space. Post, post PayPal. Post PayPal, yeah. but, but before, before LinkedIn and before yeah. Facebook. So early networks. And you've been early into a lot of things that were about connecting people and about uh, tapping into human potential. Um, those have been some of your biggest successes and the theme, not necessarily some of the other stuff out here, which is like, oh, that's a really cute kind of widget that can make this thing go faster. Um, those have not been your investments. Your investments have been deeply about what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a friend, what it means to be a human being and a connector. So Mostly. Many, yes, I mean, have some of your big ones, I know. You, you, but <laughs> it, you've invested in lots of other things. How many investments I've do you believe that. you've made? Yeah. Because one of the other things that you do that I don't think people realize is you do a lot of scattershot, of putting small amounts of money on I wouldn't say scattershot. Each yeah. one is targeted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a lot of small money in a lot of seed people. Investing seed investing. Seed investing. Yes. That's what we call it out here. It feels scattershot. <laughs> Some of the shit you've invested in feels scattershot. Okay. So how about this? Let's do this. Let's do this question. How about investments you met and passed on you wish you put money in? Can you give us one? Oh, yeah, Why well, everybody makes mistakes? What did you miss? Oh, um, well, so I missed Twitter. Um, the, uh, it started because it was audio blogging, which I was right to say that wasn't interesting, but it evolved into Twitter. Um, Do you regret it? Yes, uh, even with modern political times. <laughs> um, if you, hold on, stick with that. If you had put money in it, and let's say you had a board seat, what would you do differently right now? Oh gosh. Okay, we're getting real people, come on. <laughs> we're not in England, we're in America. Yeah. We're in, we're in America in front of a Facebook live camera. Yeah, that's true. Yes. It's not Twitter. Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, so let's, <laughs> any other ones that you, that you missed, that you passed on? Um, uh, so, um, well, look, it's a long list. Uh, I mean, seriously, it's because you're making, uh, on the judge, uh, on the balance judgments about is this thing going to be get big or not, and there's always risk, and sometimes you err and you invest what's wrong, and sometimes not. But there's a number of, of great companies um, that uh, you know, like hindsight is twenty twenty. The issue is best. Um, I remember, gosh, it must be ten years ago now. You were at Web 2.0, which is a conference, and you declared the birth of Web 3.0. It's kind of bold, and uh, you said it was going to be about data. And this was before, really, most people were talking about data. You were, again, very early on, on calling this. And I think at the time, people were just talking about machine learning, but people really weren't talking, we're talking about video about form. That was the reason I did that yes, speech, yeah. not AI at all. Um, can you talk to us about open AI? What's that? And tell us what you're doing on that front. So um, I presume that 
like the vast majority of people in the room understand that there is this interesting next generation of technology, artificial intelligence, that's in full fledged. It'll change a lot of industries. Uh, some people have described it as kind of the invention of the next electricity. That may be a little metaphorical and hyperbolic, but it is super important across a wide range of things. And so, uh, one of the things when uh, some friends like you know Sam Altman and, and, and others and I were talking about this, uh, we said, look, one of the things that's super important is that these technologies both have a organization that's driving an ethical compass uh, that includes, for example, like I was on the board of Mozilla for a long time, and part of the Mozilla com uh, uh, corporate mission is to try to help ethical compass on browsers and data and the internet. We need one of those. And then we also need to make sure that there is a set of tools in AI that are kind of equally available across businesses and governments and everything else. And this isn't become a modern kind of monopolistic area. So with that, we kicked it off. Uh, we were lucky to find a group of super smart uh, AI folks who more cared about the mission than, than the pure economics um, and so uh, they joined the mission, and that's what OpenAI is doing. So uh, let's talk about regulation. Because I'm a little nervous about the robots taking over. Sure. Um, I'm cool with the robots driving my car, and totally cool with that, because then I can text and not feel bad. Um, like, there's so many things that I'm totally fine with them doing, but I don't really want them to be my overlord. Or if so, I want to program them. And, and the likelihood. So Nancy is overlord? Totally fine with that. It's my own life. I'm sure my husband is too, not so much. So, um, so the question is like uh, regulation. So we've all just gone through the May 25th GDPR. We are all now GDPR compliant. Yay! There you go, yep. And uh, so um, talk to me about how regulation, if at all, should happen of AI. And, and then we're gonna, we're gonna talk about Facebook on Facebook Live. Um. So on general tech regulation, uh, I do think it's possible in theory to do this well. When you look at the majority of governments, their technological confidence, the way that um, most regulation proceeds, which tends to be enshrining the future versus the past, uh, most regulatory efforts actually do much more damage than they do help. Uh, and that's not an anti-regulation, don't look here, we, we've got this, we'll be fine, just trust us, kind of general point of view that governments, for example, frequently hear from technologists, as much as you have to really shape it fairly carefully. Um, like, for example, take GDPR, which at least is trying to make an effort about, you know, how do you uh, create transparency and control over people and their data, which of course is actually an extremely important thing. But like just as one issue, you say, okay, we're gonna create all these new regulations, and if you enforce those regulations in full against every company, you're basically gonna block out a whole range of startups, right? Because those startups don't have the cost structure and the ability to be able to do that. So you basically say, well, let's enshrine the existing big companies. And that's just one example of an otherwise noble effort that is actually, in fact, going to say, okay, well, let's lock in more of the current internet companies that are strong, let's keep them strong. That's our goal, right? You're like, okay, that's a little weird when we to start up an innovation. Thing. So when it gets to AI, um, you, know, you have a similar challenge, uh, which is, you know, it's like, okay, so if you say, well, we want to try to, to say, because regulation usually says, says, go from asking for forgiveness to asking for permission, and we're gonna do that here. And you're doing that in a environment where, for example, uh, the Chinese have announced that by 2030 they want to be the world leaders in the AI. And so if you say, okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna slow ourselves down and, and we're we're gonna do that unless you can somehow get uh, the Chinese involved in engagement in that. So I don't tend to go for the slow down approach personally or in recommendation. What I tend to go is say, how do we facilitate the likelihood that the outputs will have a higher uh, set of probabilities around utopia versus dystopia? So what are the things you can do? And so when I approach that as an individual, I went, well, what I can do is I can go um, meet uh, the various people or heads and the drivers of what is most likely to generate the interesting impact in AI. 
I can facilitate convocations where they're meeting other folks talking about what are the right outputs or not. Um, I can uh, try to say, look, here are the key things for safe AI safety. Here's the key things like, you know, I, I um, uh, uh, was one of the, oh, one second, uh, was one of the co-founders for an AI ethics and governance fund at MIT and Harvard, optional. which is doing, doing good work. Yeah. It's optional for all of these companies to decide whether or not to participate in. Well, um, it's optional ultimately for the companies, but I wasn't really trying to get a formal agreement from the company as much as I was trying to get the leaders of the projects involved in it. And most of these people are actually pretty good people, so you provide them the tools and so forth. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't issues, but look, there's issues in lots of areas where there isn't regulations, and then you get to areas of software, and you begin to say, okay, well, like, I don't even know what a regulation of AI would actually really look like, right? Um, and so I think the more important thing is to say, well, how do we shape it in a way, how do we help the groups that are doing it be transparent in dialogue and shape it in ways that has good outcomes? Now, relative to the jobs thing, I tend to think that everybody uh, overly emphasizes how quickly that will get there, including the technologists themselves are doing it. Because you frequently say, it's like, oh, we need a universal basic income because, you know, 10 years from now, we'll all be robot factories, we're making everything. And you're like, no, no, we're nowhere near that close. Uh, and the, the curve, even when you get to autonomous vehicles, where people say, um, uh, you know, basically, like, okay, well, driving jobs are super important. We have to deal with the transition cases. You know, that's a, a, a starter job for a lot of people. You have to deal with these kinds of things in society. All 100% true. Um, if you literally took every car manufacturing factory today and started manufacturing AV cars today, that would take eight-ish years to 15, depending a little bit on density in cities, to begin to get to where that was making that level of impact. That's some time to try to make that. And that's if they all started manufacturing them right now. So people kind of go, the robots are coming for your jobs. And it's like, well, not really. And by the way, we do have translocations of productivity. And I do have a rational belief that a lot of other jobs will be created. Now, I think most of those jobs will be created through entrepreneurship, which is one of the reasons why, like, like a surprise to me over the last couple of decades has been how much my time to be has been supporting entrepreneurship. Um. Uh, so our jobs are safe, or at least our kids' jobs maybe are safe for a little while. Or new jobs. There'll Senti be new jobs. There'll be new jobs. Sentiment analysis, we've already talked about, is really not there yet, and is, and is a, a fair way off. Let's talk about, so, so you're not so worried about AI regulation. Let's talk about another area of regulation, because you're one of the few people out here who actually will talk about regulation, because most people are in technology and in Silicon Valley are pretty libertarian. We can talk about why that is in a second, too. But let's talk about social media. Um, so a couple things. Uh, one is the, the UK, interestingly enough, appointed in January a Minister of Loneliness. Yeah, that's, that's, I should ask you about that. that that's more your. Yeah, but I get to ask the questions yeah, tonight. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, so one question I have is the impact of social media, you think, on, on society? Like, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And then in the end, you've already said before, technology isn't good or bad, it's how humans use it. It's yes. how we choose to use it. So let me ask you about the regulation on the how we choose to use it. Let's go to regulation and let's talk about Facebook on Facebook. So, um, fake news. How should we effectively counter it? We've got elections coming in 2018. Frankly, I'm just gonna put it out there to everyone watching in the UK. I, I am totally fine if you just want to look at the last 240 years as a giant experiment and maybe take us back. It was a John Cleese letter to that effect. Oh really? Because I'm yeah. fine with it. We can all drink warm beer. <laughs> Americans will adjust. We can all put milk in our tea. And, and then we can stop this silly American folly with Cadbury and eat true British Cadbury. But you know we've destroyed the recipe? I don't know if you know the whole story. Anyway, um, so I'm fine if you take us back. But short of that, and with this election coming in 2018 and 2020, and we are going to talk about that because I know you care deeply about this stuff, um, there's information warfare going on. How can we effectively counter fake news? So uh, I think it's a challenging area. Um, one of the things that people frequently do is they like to blame the social media companies, Facebook and Twitter. When you know you look at Fox and Friends, you look at Sinclair Media, you look at Talk 
radio and you realize that the question about the bubble and attacks on truth has actually been going on for some time. Um, and, uh, and so I think that there's a real issue here. Now, I'd say broadly, the, the pattern that I encourage people when they think about technology is to say it isn't like there's, there's been problems. Like, by the way, it's totally rational that these companies did not think they were going to be attacked by hostile foreign powers. Right? That's not usually how a company thinks about itself, but I'm going to be a playground. Show. So being surprised by that, I thought, was totally fine. And I think gearing up to say, okay, now we have to make sure that it doesn't happen. And you know, I know that there's a lot of work being put in, especially on the Facebook side, to try to make sure this, this game is not played in, uh, again as much as possible. And I think that's partially. Well, in fairness, it was going on a long time before they discovered it. Yeah, yeah, but again, they weren't really looking for it. Like, it wasn't, it wasn't, unlike a nation state where they say, oh, th this is our purview, we need to be doing that. That wasn't the thing that they were looking for. And by the way, I don't think if I had been sitting there, I don't think I would have been looking for it. I and then been, once it's discovered, what responsibility does a company owe to its citizens and users? Two different things, citizens and users. What responsibility does a company owe to us? Uh, well, I think, um, I probably can't give it lead answer just because this is a work in progress. But I think the responsibility of a company, which I, I know from the conversation that Facebook is doing from this, is to try to figure out how to align expectations of truth with what users are expecting and what they're seeing and how they're interpreting it with, uh, with, with, with the fact that their expectation matches reality. That they're not actually in fact being deceived. That they're not actually in fact uh, believing something that's that's different. Like they think they're getting truth and they're not getting truth. Or they think that they're. Is that because it's good for business, or is that because it's the right thing to do, or should that be because someone regulates it? Uh, well, I think the best forms of, of these patterns of regulation, because regulation is usually this blunt force of trying to pass for the future, is you know like the patterns that I tend to recommend are things like the MPAA, which is you have a, a dialogue that says, look, unless you get the self-regulation stuff in shape, then we're going to lower the, the boom, and you won't like the boom, because we won't do it well. So just for everybody, you talked about this, but they have to see these conversations. Yeah. That's what happened with television in the United States. Basically, in television, there started being bad things like the Beatles on our TV, <laughs> and, um, and, and Elvis gyrating, and so there was all kinds of regulation that came up from the FCC. And then the movie industry was like, oh, we don't want that. We better do something about this, and they self-regulated it. Which is, you know, that moment right now, although this current president doesn't have a heck of a lot of an incentive to regulate social media. So, um, yeah. Okay, John likes that. All right, cool. Um, yes, he'll tweet about it in right. a couple minutes. <laughs> Hello. Um, 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 By the way, two things just to say on politics. Uh, you may be getting the Oh, there's pressure. more coming. Oh. Um, so, when, because this is the, this particular audience. Um, when the Brexit vote happened, um, I emailed a bunch of my British friends and I said, well, congratulations um, for one of the rare times in history you've taken an idiot prize from us. Uh, um, and then when uh, November 9th, 2016 happened, I emailed those same friends and said, we took the idiot prize back from you. <laughs> so let's start, let's, start, let's start talking politics then. So let's start this way. I know that you and I, when we were younger, played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons. Anyone else here a D and D player when you were younger? Okay. I mean, there's Marshall scholars in the room. I know we have some nerds here. Okay. So if Donald Trump was a monster, <laughs> what monster would Donald Trump be, and what power would you have needed to take him down? <laughs> um. Well, the natural answer would be like some version of undead, and you need a paladin um, from a first from a first order bit. Um, I guess probably um, a zombie reality television star, um, and maybe holy water. Holy water, nice, yes. nice. Um, I mean, which is a nice segue. You, you did hang with the Pope. <laughs> That's a bit overstating it, but yes, I have. Um, um, uh, and the po I understand the Pope was looking for bots on AI. Yep. Is that right? Yes. Um, he, look, so one of the things I, I, I think this Pope is one of the 
most awesome, not just popes, but like people. And uh, he is very attentive to what artificial intelligence impact on humanity generally might be. Highly focused on kind of work and jobs and meaningfulness of life, and so want to understand it more. And so, you know, it's obvious, you know, I was delighted to try to help with whatever two sets of wisdom I have. Did you tell him that you funded the Disobedience Award? We didn't get to that. Okay. Tell us about the Disobedience Award. So uh, last year was the first one. It's the MIT Media Lab uh, Disobedience Award. The target is people who take personal risk for social good. And now, naturally, we understand that in the context of politics. It's you know, people re uh, resisting um, uh, really bad things in society, you know, civil disobedience, you know, our own um, work, uh, you know, the work that has happened for decades here in the US on questions like race and other sorts of and so, um, but it actually also is an important thing, not just in, in politics and the world of society, it's an important thing in art, it's an important thing in science, that's an important thing in culture. And so part of the idea is to, to say that this, the part of how we get better as a society, we get better as a people, is that some people stand up for uh, truth, usually if you're speaking truth to power, which is usually scary and dangerous. And so last year's uh, winner were the water blowers, the whistleblowers in the water crisis in Flint, followed by uh, three. Yeah, we can clap for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> followed by the Standing Rock mo uh, movement. Uh, there's a, which I didn't know until this process came about, there was this thing in Georgia called Freedom University, because the state passed a law on you shall not teach any undocumented people on state university grounds. And so they went and started assembling networks of people to teach off grounds, Freedom University. And then um, uh, Dr. James Hansen, who was the NASA scientist who risked his career talking about climate change. So, um, what? Yeah. Like, so <laughs> many people out here have made so much money and they don't do this. So, were you dropped on your head or something? Like, <laughs> what? Why are you so good? <laughs> don't ask me that question. Um, Why are you so good? Look, I, I will reject the fact that I am the, there are others, like for example. Not enough. There are so many people who are not in this moment and when, when babies are being ripped from their families at the border. I mean, like, the worst stuff you could have, this is, I'm a Jew. I, I feel like I've been here before, right? Like, some of the worst stuff you could imagine is happening, and people are, like, just buying another Tesla and chilling out here. You are not. You are spending, I, I would, it looks like something like 60 to 70% of your time on these serious citizenship issues. Why? Well, I do have an essay uh, that I haven't published yet, which is originally titled Spider-Man Ethics, uh, which is ben with Parker, power, with power comes responsibility. responsibility. Right? Technically, his, his, his uncle said yes, it to uncle, him. Yes, but, yes, yeah. but, but you know, it's people will- Yeah, Spider-Man, I'm with people, you. People might read something totally. with the title Spider-Man Ethics. Totally, um, Ben Parker's advice wouldn't go as far. Yes, wouldn't yeah. go as far. Nerd street code, anyone? <laughs> Okay, keep going. <laughs> um, and look, I think a lot of people um, work on, not everyone, some people are just in it for themselves, just in it for the money, just in it for the fame. Um, but a lot of people work on what their vision of the good is. And sometimes what you need to do is, is, is uh, grow what their vision of the good could be. It's one of the reasons why, amongst the many good things that, uh, for example, is a shining example, you know, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates do with the Gates Foundation, is they also do the Giving Pledge event. And part of the point of the Giving Pledge event is to say, <coughs> come and talk about the kinds of things you could do, and the kinds of things aside, the kind of things that work, and the kind of way to have a real impact, and so forth. Uh, and so, I do think there are, are a number of other folks, and I think it's once they start focusing on, well, what are the things that you could do here, and that the, that the only path, or kind of, it's, it cannot be the only path, just building a really big company is the only path to doing good. So it's a, it is a path to doing it's good. A path. It could be. So I think this comes back full circle. Um, you have said that the reason you 
went to Oxford, the reason you were a Marshall Scholar is that you wanted to spend time outside the US. You wanted to broaden your horizon and the way you think about things. How much do you think your time at Oxford and your time living outside the United States shapes this worldview? Oh, I think it's pretty essential. I mean, one of the things that um, I found, I, you know, one of the problems we have in the US uh, generally, and even though you have more cosmopolitan areas like New York or San Francisco and so forth, is, is we don't have a lot of exposure to other cultures, other ways of thinking. And it was already in the second or third week uh, when I was in the UK that I was beginning to, to meet and have much more serious conversations with people that range from you know, Africa to Russia to Australia. Um, don't forget, no, well, you know, a lot of people from India, you know, um, but I think it was the second or third year I met someone by Southeast Asia or something. Um, and, um, and those conversations about like, okay, well, how do, like the question you open with is who, who are we, who should we become? And uh, how do you think about the world? How do you think about uh, kind of like important topics like what is friendship or uh, you know, how we should, what counts as evolution in society? How do we think, we all think, like here's a, another uh, essay we're working on. It. One of the funny things is you take a time slice and we, look back at, at culture 50 to 80 years ago, and we go, can you believe those people, dot, 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 fill in a few blanks. Um, and, and then you wonder, well, what do people 50 to 80 years now come think about us? <laughs> what are the things that we need to change to be on the trajectory towards that? Um, and that all of that kind of thinking was hugely enabled by being able to be in serious conversation uh, with a much more kind of globally based uh, society, um, and also with kind of you know was the George Bernard Shaw line, um, two countries divided by a common language. You were 21 when you went over. Oh, okay, 21, yeah. 20. um, what advice would you give yourself if you could give that 21 year old like headed off to Oxford, going to the UK? What advice would you give yourself if you could look back now? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> no, the other question could be too, but I, just, like, I haven't actually, the funny thing is I ask versions of that question myself. Um, that specific one of going to the UK, I actually have not thought about that. Um, I guess what I would say would be um, uh, try to, to connect a little bit more, not just intellectually and academically, but culturally. I backed into the cultural stuff. It was the, it was, I started learning as I started saying, oh, this isn't just a intellectual or philosophical point of view. There's actually kind of a question about how you order your life, how, how you ascribe things of meaningfulness, uh, how you look at this in a way, and how do I treat that more seriously? And I got to that by starting with kind of intellectual debate. It's like, we must debate for finding the truth. Remember, it was a young man, right? So, uh, and, then go back into, oh, I should actually treat this as an understanding journey. And, and the faster I would have gotten there, I think I would have learned more. It sounds like you got out of the Marshall Scholarship exactly what you were supposed to. Mm -hmm. No, it was, uh, and the other thing, by the way, that was hugely useful was that um, between the dual lenses of Stanford and Oxford, it made my thinking a lot crisper. Do Two different. Do you consider yourself a public intellectual after all? Uh, I aspire to it, but I don't think I'm there yet. I don't know. How many of you have listened to Masters of Scale, to any episode of Masters of Scale, or read one of his two books, or will pre-order tonight his third one, <laughs> coming out in October. He did not ask me to do this. I am doing this. It's coming out in October. It's called Blitz Scaling. Return to the second. Um, you are one of those people who do public comment on things, and you're not, you're not too shy. My favorite one was when you offered what was it you offered uh, the, 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 the $5 million offer? Do you want to maybe describe that? <laughs> uh, yes, someone remembers. Um, so uh, I popped my head up from the LinkedIn Microsoft uh, negotiation because we announced the deal. And I looked around. Does, has anyone, does anyone not know what he's talking about when he says the LinkedIn Microsoft deal? 
Oh, well, that's cute. They don't know. Why don't you describe it? <laughs> well, How I, much did Microsoft pay for LinkedIn? Uh, $26 billion. That's $26 billion. You should clap for that, too. This guy is your fan. Okay, so you uh, popped your head up from the $26 billion deal, and? And I, um, uh, I realized that the election was going to be close. And so I started calling my friends, everyone who would pick up the phone, uh, and uh, saying, you need to get in the fight. And then realized that nothing was really happening, that a lot of people were roughly like, oh, Hillary's going to win it for sure. You don't need to bother with this. It's kind of a joke. The joke was on us. Um, and, um, and so I, uh, um, I started thinking, okay, what are the things I can do? What can I do starting in August to try to make a difference? Uh, and so I was looking for opportunities, and one of the things I saw um, uh, was a challenge that a military veteran had made to Trump to reveal um, uh, Trump's taxes uh, uh, as part of general anti-corruption and other things that are now super embarrassing as part of America. And I said, oh, I can uh, go um, essentially say, and I'll add in $5 million to veterans' causes if, uh, if essentially Trump reveals his taxes because I wanted to essentially have a public challenge of, look, you care so little about veterans, you won't even do something that's free for you that would get $6 million to the veterans. That's what I want to show the world about you. Um, because like I would have been delighted to do it. Um, and, uh, I think you showed something about us, about you rather, when you did that, not just about us or about him, but you showed something about yourself in the middle of a $26 billion negotiation. You poke your head up, not just poke your head up, but you put your neck out there. Because anybody who says anything to him or about him, he tweets about, he comes after. And you put yourself out there. You're one of the first who really, as a business leader, put yourself out there and said, um, this guy's scary, and I don't like the direction this country's going in. So I just I want to say thank you, and, um, yeah. and I want to I want I want to open it up for other questions and just I just want to we open up questions because I just want to add the thing is this is less for this room and more because we have a live camera in the world, uh, but the room I think will appreciate this too. Uh, look, my. I think any model of Trump that isn't reality television star uh, is wrong. All he's doing is playing for the ratings every day. He has no model of governance. He does not have a theory of like what is better healthcare. And he doesn't actually even really care about this stuff. So now we are all living in a reality television show. Uh, and that is like scary and a nightmare for our place. Did you ever run for office? No. No, that's not, look, I, uh, uh, my expertise is as a as a product strategist, as a business strategist, as a board member, as an investor. You know, it's a small company thing, but but for scale organizations, uh, you know, there's other super talented people who can do that. You're pretty great at picking super talented people and companies. Who do you like in 2020? <laughs> um, so uh, the real challenge for 2020. I suspect there will be at least 30 people running on the Democrat side. Um, and so you're going to need to have crowd control in the debates. Will people with the last name between A and G please go over to this room? Um, and so, and that's scary from the viewpoint of what, um, what we care about because more or less, I think you, have a, you would have a high probability of getting a better president if you picked randomly from the phone book. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that the, uh, there are a set of candidates that I, or people who I think uh, consider seriously that are running, uh, but it's not for me to help them. Ooh. Okay, let's open up for questions from other people. Are there other people who have burning questions? Yep. I'll repeat it so that they can hear you. Go ahead. Central thing to do 
is uh, uh, turn the House Democrat, <laughs> right? Uh, and so really go and figure out how you can participate in the 2018 uh, House and Senate uh, elections. Among the things that uh, I think that turning the uh, House Democrat is, um, I would be terrified if the House doesn't turn Democrat that Trump will try to trump up some reason for firing Mueller and undercut the rule of law in this country. Uh, and so uh, all of that all comes back to making a political change there. Uh, and so whether that's money or anything else. Now on the specific uh, border control issue, the kind of, like I, I thought it was kind of classic, a little bit of political naivete for the letters that, that in various companies they're going saying stop you know, providing services to the Immigration Customs Service. And then there was like a San Francisco demonstration uh, where San Francisco was operating as a safety a sanctuary city. So you're demonstrating in front of the audience. But some of the people were saying, we're not enforcing. Like, we're acting as a, as a sanctuary city. So I think that the, the key thing is to say, how do you make political change? And, and it's a little bit harkening back to one of the things that I really liked Obama said uh, towards the end, which is that, you know, don't boo, vote. 23andMe, I don't know if anyone even saw what 23andMe did, and Wajiki and, and 23andMe um, said that they would give DNA kits to any of those families and kids to hopefully reconnect them because, you know, uh, how do you find babies in a system who can't speak or don't know their parents' name? I thought that was a pretty, that, great. Um, uh, that was a pretty awesome. great move. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else have, a, have other questions? Way in the back. Do you want to stick up yep, way in, hello? <laughs> Almost in England. Hi, so uh, speaking about President 